and the Rattler of Grey is back. Welcome back, everybody. More of Dragon Age. Alright, so I think we are ready to move on. Ah, oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> Let us return to camp. Right? I think that's kind of where we want to go. Yeah, let's go back to camp. The blight. How will you end it? We have to fight the archdemon. Is that all? It is surrounded by an ocean of darkspawn. How will you reach it? If you reach it, how will you slay it? You say you are a Grey Warden. I have heard stories of this order. What have you heard? Great strategists and peerless warriors. That is what we hear of the Wardens. So far, I am not impressed. So Sten is probably slightly angry that uh, he walked out of that a walking corpse, but... I'm not here to impress you. Evidently not. It remains only to see what you are here for. Wow. Apparently Sten really liked that. Okay. Sure. If there's anything I can do for you, please, please, tell me. There are any rumors? The dark spawn have attacked Lothering. I don't think everyone even had fled by the time they came, either. Word has it they swarmed the entire area, making off with prisoners and burning down the buildings. And then they were gone. Just as quick. I wonder if there's anyone left. I heard some chanters were going to head down south, maybe to try to find some survivors. And I'm not holding out hope myself. That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. I'm sure you'll be pleased with the goods my boy and I have collected. And with your discount. Right. Tome of physical... Oh, jeez. Wait. I mean, there's definitely some great stuff. Um, The backpack is probably fairly useful, right? Especially for loot whores such as myself. So let's go with that. Let's uh let's go to talking. We haven't really talked to a lot of people. So let's Yeah, I guess let's just do some talking in this episode. Then I'll go. Good boy. <laughs> Alistair. What do you need? Like to ask you something. Ask away. What can a Templar do exactly? Essentially, they're trained to fight. The Chantry would tell you that the Templars exist simply to defend. But don't let them fool you. They're an army. The other main purpose for a Templar is, of course, to hunt mages. To that end, we train in talents that drain mana and disrupt spells. So, could in others learn these talents? Perhaps, but there usually isn't much of an opportunity. The Chantry keeps a close rein on its Templars. We are given Lyrium to help develop our magical talents, you see. Which means we become addicted. And since the Chantry controls the Lyrium trade with the Dwarves, well, I'm sure you can put two and two together. So you were addicted? Thankfully, no. You only start receiving Lyrium once you've taken your vows. You don't need Lyrium in order to learn the Templar talents. Lyrium just makes Templar's talents more effective. Or so I was told. Maybe it doesn't even do that. The Chantry usually doesn't let their Templars get away, either, so they can spread their secrets. I'm a bit of an exception. Lucky me. Okay. Lils. Yes? I think you should go. No, I'd like to talk. Well, here I am. What would someone like you be doing in Lothering's Chantry? What is meant by someone like me? Uh, they don't 
teach you how to fight in the cloister, do they? Did you think I was always a cloistered sister? The Chantry provides succor and safe harbor to all who seek it. I chose to stay and become affirmed. Affirmed? We affirm our belief in the Maker, in Andraste and the Chant, but other than that, there are no vows taken. And why were you seeking safe harbor? The Chantry does not pride, and you should. I desired time apart from the world. I was a traveling minstrel in Orlais. Tales and songs were my life. I performed, and they rewarded me with applause and coin. And my skill in battle? Well, you pick up different skills when you travel, yes? Yes, of course. Um, let's move on. I was just thinking about what happened to the elves, and I... I'm reminded of a song sung to me many years ago. It was when my mother died. And this wise elven woman comforted me and told me that we shouldn't fear death or hate it. Death is just another beginning. One day, we must all shed our earthly bodies to allow our spirits to fly free. We believe that we return to the stone and become ancestors. And thus you embark upon another journey. Death is just the gateway. Yes? Well, here I am. Uh, you were a traveling minstrel. Do you have any tales to share? Of course I do. I love stories far too much to keep them to myself. Everyone should be able to benefit from them, I think. Tell me about the Darkspawn. Chantry Law says it is man's pride that created the Darkspawn. In ages past, the mages of the Tevinder Imperium ruled much of the world we know. In their pride, they thought their magics invincible and imagined that they were greater than the Maker himself. So thinking, they invaded his golden city, planning to take it for themselves and depose their own creator. But they were impure and full of sin. And it is with the sin that they tainted the golden city, corrupting it forever. The Maker cursed them 
and cast them from his sight. Wherever they went, they spread the taint of their sin. Any land that was touched by the taint became blighted and would suffer no life. Instead, the darkspawn arose to torment us and remind us of our hubris. Know any stories from Orlais? Of course, Orlesians enjoy telling stories. I shall tell you my favorite tale of Aveline, the Knight of Orlais. Go ahead. A long time ago, a girl child was born to a farmer. He had hoped for a son, not a daughter, and so he told his wife to abandon the child in the woods. Before the cold could claim her, the baby was found by a tribe of Dalish elves who took pity on the poor mewling thing and raised her as their own. Avelyn, for that is what they called her, grew strong and quick and clever under the guidance of the elves. She learned to wield the sword as well as any man, could kill a deer with an arrow at hundred paces, and was as graceful on the back of a horse as she was on foot. Continue. Aveline's Dalish guardians saw that she could easily best any Olesian chevalier in battle, and wanted to show the cruel humans the child they had left to die. They bestowed upon her a fine horse and armor, and sent her to prove herself to her people in the Grand Tourney. Now in those days, no woman was allowed to take up arms, let alone compete in the Grand Tourney, but Aveline kept her helmet on and was not discovered. Aveline won many events and gained the approval of the adoring crowd. Eventually, she came face to face with the knight Kaleva in the Grand Melee. Aveline had already bested him in the joust, and Kaleva was determined not to lose a second time. Out of desperation to regain his honor, Kaleva tripped Aveline and tossed her to the ground, ripping off her helmet as he did so. Silence fell upon the arena as Aveline was revealed. Kaleva declared the previous competitions invalid. A woman had taken part, and this was not allowed. But the crowd cheered for Aveline. Kaleva was furious, for he had lost to a woman and was now being shamed. Blinded by his rage, he forced Aveline to her knees. Know your place, woman, cried he, and slit her throat. That's terrible. The son of the king, Prince Freyan, was present. He recognized Aveline's skill and bravery and began to see the injustice done to the women in his land. When he was made king, he rewrote the laws of Ole so that women could also become chevalier. He honored Aveline and knighted her after her death. And to this day, any female who is knighted reveres Aveline the Brave, for she is the patron of all women chevalier. Do you know any for Elden legends? I know one. Told to me by my mother a long time ago, it always chilled me to the bone. Maybe you have heard of Flemeth? <laughs> yes, I have heard of Flemeth. Ferelden mothers scare their daughters with talk of Flemeth. They say that if you're bad, Flemeth will spirit you away and bind you to her forever. They also say that Flemeth mourns her lost beauty and will steal yours through your looking glass if she catches you. Tell me the whole story. Flemeth's beauty was known throughout the land. She had hair like unto a moonless night, skin as pale as winter's first snow, and eyes as beautiful and perilous as the sea. When she came of age, she came to the attention of the Lord of Hyever, Conobar, and he took her for his wife. Conobar soon learned that his young bride had the gift of magic. He kept this a secret for he feared that she would be taken from him. Flemeth stayed with Conobar for some years, and with his blessing, she practiced her art. And then one day, a young poet named Osen came to the castle. Flemeth was captivated by Osen's voice, and he by her beauty, and they fell in love. What happened then? Flemeth longed to be with her true love, and she and Osen fled from Conobar's lands, seeking refuge in the Kokari wilds with the chasing tribes. They lived there happily for many a year, till the day Flemeth received news that Conobar was dying and longed to see her face one last time. Flemeth's heart 
swelled with pity for the man who once was her husband and begged Osen to return to Konobar's side with her. But when Flemeth and Osen entered Hyeva, they were captured by Konobar's men and Osen was slain in front of Flemeth's eyes. Flemeth was imprisoned in the highest tower of the castle, there to await Konobar's judgment on her. Distraught at the loss of her love, Flemeth plotted revenge against her husband. She summoned a fey demon, intending for it to wreak vengeance on Conobar. But a spell went awry. The demon possessed Flemeth. Turning her into an abomination, the halls of the castle ran red with blood as Flemeth slaughtered Conobar and all his men. The last of Flemeth's humanity melted away, and at dawn, she stole back to the wilds to plot and scheme for a hundred years. They say she took to her side many chastened men, and with their help, begat her daughter witches, who even now prowl the dark places of the Kokari wilds. There was another story I wanted to hear. Which one? Ah. Do you know anything about the Dalish? I have heard a little about how the elves gained their freedom from the Tevinter Imperium. When Andraste began her exalted march against the Imperium, the elves joined her cause to fight their masters. The great elven leader, Shatan, born in captivity, rose up to lead his people. He foresaw a future where the elves were free. Shatan was killed when Andraste was betrayed, but the elves continued to fight eventually breaking free of the Imperium. The Elves claimed the Dales in the south and settled there in the land of their own. It didn't last. The Elves lived in the Dales for centuries. They resurrected the worship of the Elven gods and would allow the building of no Chantry. This angered the Chantry, and the hostility between the two factions finally broke out in open war. The Chantry says the Elves struck first, but I do not know whether to believe it. The Chantry declared a wholly exalted march against the Elves, named for Andraste's similar march against the Winter. During the exalted march of the Dales, the Elven cities were sacked and the Elven state completely dissolved. Some of the Elves bitterly accepted their fates and surrendered to human rule, living in the human cities as second-class citizens. But others, still fiercely proud of their heritage, refused to bow to the humans and instead became homeless wanderers. There were the Elves of the Dales, the Dalish. What do you know of Andraste? Andraste was the Maker's chosen. The Maker had long since abandoned the world when the sound of her singing turned his ear. Beauty, grace and wisdom enraptured him and he offered to take her from this flawed world to become his divine bride. But Andraste had an earthly husband and would not forsake him. Instead, she beseeched the Maker to return to his people once more. So earnest was her plea that the Maker was moved and promised that he would create a paradise on earth if all abandoned their false gods and turned once more to him. And this is why Andraste began her exalted march on the idolaters of the Tevinter Imperium. The Maker granted her his powers with which to smite her enemies. Andraste brought the Imperium to its knees, and her victories converted many to the worship of the Maker. How did Andraste die? Alas, it was the frailties of men that betrayed and killed Andraste. Her earthly husband, Maferath, a chieftain of the Alamari tribes himself, grew jealous as his wife's popularity and influence overshadowed his own. She was also revered as the Maker's betrothed, and Maferath began to see their own bond waning in significance as Andraste became ever more devoted to the Maker. Out of envy and spite, Maferath made a pact with the Archon Hesarian of Tevinta, allowing his beloved Andraste to be ambushed and captured. Andraste was burned at the stake in Minrathus, the capital of Tevinta. Why did the Maker not save her with his own power? I have thought on this too. Did he withdraw his sight from her at that moment? Where were all the powers he bestowed upon her? This question has come to me many times, and I have no answer. Perhaps there was no way for Andraste to return to the Maker but through her death. 
we will never know for sure. Let's just move on. So, we got a number of stories out of that. Yes. Are there any other? Well, here I am. Uh, okay, it doesn't seem like it. We spoke with Sir Alistair. Emissary. You witnessed the rarest of things, Warden. The Dalish stand ready to defend Ferelden. Do you need anything? We have assembled on a short schedule. Certain factors of equipment could be better. Crafting components would serve best. Basic ones like elf root and deep mushroom. Let's go chat with Stan. Yes. I wanted to discuss something you mentioned. Speak then. What did you mean about the fiends of Serhan? <laughs> Ours wear the faces of men. Do you mean their abominations? No. They do not have the excuse of demons within them. Darkspawn, abominations, plagues, and storms. Men are far more dangerous than these. One moment of betrayal can bring more ruin than an earthquake. You know this. What did they do? They are Talvashoth. They say they are Grey Ones. True in the knowledge of themselves. They are gaping holes where men used to be. Nothing can fill them. What did they want? I don't know. There was a village in the mountains of Saharon. Farmers. They grew cinnamon and nutmeg trees in perfectly ordered rows. There would always be one person waiting. A foreman, a harvester, rank didn't matter. Often they would say nothing. Simply watch as we worked to examine the empty house. A new one each time. That had once been the home of a colleague. A friend. We always made a point of searching. Now and then a body would turn up in a river eaten by rain and crows. More often we found nothing. Even in the worst parts of the jungle the villagers would send someone with us. To see the tiniest piece of bone or cloth. Anything contained the possibility of their lost friend. Must we speak of this? We could be fighting something. Another question? Very well. Why did the Talbashoth fight you? Isn't it the nature of a wound to bleed? I have no more answers than you. Why do we fight the Darkspawn? Why do the Darkspawn fight us? There has to be an explanation. Why? Do the reasons matter? It makes little difference to those they fight. Tell me then, why do you fight? Because I have to. Yes, there is no other reason. The Talvashoth wish us dead, and we wish to go on living. The point of our war is war. Very well. Then I suggest we move on. All right. As you wish. Uh, one last person. Miss Morrigan. I await your command. So life in the wilds must have been very lonely. At times, perhaps. A world full of people and buildings and things was all very foreign to me. If I wished companionship, I ran with the wolves and flew with the birds. If I spoke, twas to the trees. But you eventually left? Such simple pleasures will only enthrall for so long. I recall the first time I crept beyond the edge of the wilds. I did so in animal form, remaining in the shadows and watching these strange townsfolk from afar. I happened upon a noblewoman by her carriage, adorned in sparkling garments the likes of which I had never before seen. I was dazzled. This, to me, seemed what true wealth and beauty must be. I snuck up behind her and stole a hand mirror from the carriage. It was encrusted in gold and crystalline gemstones, and I hugged it to my chest with delight as I sped back to the wilds. What happened? Flemeth was furious with me. I was a child and had not yet come into my full power, and I had risked discovery for the sake of a pretty bauble. To teach me a lesson, Flemeth took the mirror and smashed it upon the ground. 
I was heartbroken. But you were just a child. And a foolish one. Flemeth was right to break me of my fascination. Beauty and love are fleeting and have no meaning. Survival has meaning. Power has meaning. Without those lessons, I would not be here today, as difficult as they might have been. But you don't need to live that way any longer. Do I not? I am still an apostate mage, even if I have left the wilds. The Darkspawn are yet undefeated. No, there is much that remains. To return to your original question, perhaps my time in the wilds was indeed lonely. But such was how it had to be. I find myself at times wondering what might have become of the girl with the beautiful golden mirror. But such fantasies have no place amidst reality. Hey, talk to me. I await your command. Like to discuss something personal. We are in camp, so tis as good a time as any. Why are you still here? I am here because Flemeth commanded me to aid you. Why? Do you wish me to leave? I can do so if you prefer. No, I don't want you to leave. Then I assume our discussion ends here. <laughs> wow, might have stand on that one. Yeah, I think I remember that from last time. Well, I believe, folks, this is a good place to cut the episode off and get ready to adventure yet again. So, as always, thanks for watching. Tune in the next. Thanks for watching, everybody. It is greatly appreciated.